The rumour has it that this was one of pop artist Andy Warhol's favourite movies. I can dig that. When I first saw this film on late night TV in the 60s, it blew my mind because it had interesting ideas in it. With a minimal budget, abstract sets and costumes sourced from Hollywood costume warehouses, the creation of the humanoids showed us a world that looked like a 1950s science fiction magazine illustration. After an atomic war, humanity creates humanoid robots known pejoratively as clickers to help keep the civilization going. The movie's protagonist, Kragus, played by Don McGowan, is a member of a human centric fascist movement called the Order of Flesh and Blood, which is basically an anti robot KKK. He's also a gerontologist working to increase human lifespan because radiation is lowering birth rates. His sister Esme is in rapport with a robot called Pax. Pax is more of a man than Miles. Or you could ever be. She seems emotionally and by implication sexually satisfied by her robot partner, which really pisses off Kragus. Meanwhile, Kragus himself meets and falls in love with a woman called Maxine. But as Kragus and Maxine soon discover, their world isn't quite what they think it is. By the first of next month, we will outnumber the humans. This is one of the talkiest science fiction movies of the 1960s, but don't let that put you off. It's crammed full of ideas that question the very nature of being human, and it transcends the low budget in a unique and memorable way. It's sometimes clumsy and the acting is quite wooden, but it shows the filmmaker trying to do something different. It gives us science fiction which is speculative and not merely spectacular. Based very loosely on a 1953 short story by Robert Shickley, Elio Petri's La Decima Vitima is one of the grooviest looking movies of the decade. In this pop art near future, a global game called The Big Hunt, where people track, hunt and kill each other for prizes and social status, is a big part of the culture. Marcello Mastroianni with dyed blonde hair stars as Marcello Paletti, a hunter with a complicated love life, and Ursula Andrus as Caroline Meredith, another hunter who is not adverse to killing a target in a kinky strip club using a gun bra. Marcello and Carolyn are matched by the master computer for their tenth hunt, but as she tracks her prey, they fall in love. From building sites in New York City to high-tech decadence in Rome, the movie takes us to a savage future that predates the Hunger Games, Battle Royale, and Arnold Schwarzenegger's yellow onesie in The Running Man. Cinematographer Gianni Di Venanzo, who worked with Fellini and Antonioni, and the production designer Piero Paletto give us a sumptuous 1960s future, full of cubist furniture, toy robots, art installations, and killers endorsing commercial products. The highways have roadside brothels, and there are cultists worshipping the setting sun while agitators throw tomatoes at them. Add to this Piero Piccioni's jazz soundtrack and two charismatic stars, and you have a movie that's more style than substance, but the style is ineffably groovy. The tenth victim mocks sports, celebrity culture, media violence and consumerism, and what's not to like about that? Roger Vadim's Barbarella, based on the comic strip by Jean-Claude Forrest, was very controversial at the time. A decadent European director had married an American film actress, Jane Fonda, daughter of film icon Henry Fonda, and they made a silly movie with her in which she appeared nude. Don't expect this movie to make sense. There were eight people involved in the screenplay. Terry Southern, Roger Vadim, Claude Brulé, Vittoria Bonicelli, Clement Biddlewood, Brian Dagar, Tudor Gates and Jean-Claude Forrest himself. If you have any problems following the plot logic, that's probably the reason. And also, let's be honest, any sexy movie from the 1960s is going to be problematic in the 21st century. Barbarella, an astronaut from Earth, 
is sent to the Tower City system to find a missing Earth scientist, Duran Duran. Yes, the band was named after this movie character. Earth is a peaceful, sexually liberated planet, but the 16th planet of Tower City is a place where children are free range until they become useful and are rounded up like cattle. And an evil queen rules the decadent, hedonistic city of Sogo. Hello, pretty, pretty. Which sits above the Matmos, a liquid form of pure evil energy. Do you want to come and play with me? Or someone like you, I charge nothing. Barbarella meets Mark Han, the child catcher, a nervy revolutionary Dildano, Professor Ping, played by Marcel Marceau, and John Philip Law's Pygar, a blind, depressed angel. Like the tenth victim, this is style over substance with an iconic soundtrack by Mike Kerb and Glurhouse. Fonda's talent for comedy helps us through the silliness. And Anita Pallenberg's Evil Queen, voiced by British actress Joan Greenwood, is a cosplayer's delight. The production design and special effects are wonderful, and leaving aside some of the sexual politics, Barbarella is a lot of fun. Any movie that starts out with a zero-G striptease has got something going for it. Produced by the legendary George Powell and directed by Byron Haskin, who also gave us Charlton Heston fighting billions of soldier ants in the naked jungle over a decade before, The Power is based on Frank M. Robinson's novel, and it plays with the nature of reality decades before Doctor Strange or Inception. Starting with the, one of the best later soundtracks by Miklos Rocha, using cymbalums and violins, this movie survives a bland protagonist played by George Hamilton, to give us a fantastic piece of genre cinema. At a laboratory where the limits of human endurance are being investigated, a scientist played by Arthur O'Connell suspects that one of the other scientists in the lab is a superhumanly intelligent being as far beyond humans as humans are to animals. When he dies under mysterious circumstances, Jim Tanner, played by George Hamilton, investigates and finds himself and his fellow scientists, the target of this Superman, who is known as Adam Hart. With a solid cast of character actors like Earl Holliman, Suzanne Plachet, Michael Rennie and Yvonne DiCarlo, the movie builds its paranoid suspense really well. The visual manifestations of Adam Hart's attacks, from walls disappearing where doors once were, to mind controlling people so that their very nature changes works really well within the limitations of the cinema technology at the time. The power is inventive, interesting and at times shows us the fragile nature of reality. This is the kind of movie that people used to call trippy. Not many people know about it but it's worth checking out. Jean-Luc Godard's Alphaville is a work of genius. American actor Eddie Constantine plays a hardball detective called Lemmy Caution, who he played in six previous French movies. He was a tough, hard-drinking, womanising private eye and immensely popular in France. In Alphaville, Goddard takes Lemmy Caution to a new level. In this one, he's a galactic secret agent who travels to the planet Alphaville to find a missing agent to kill or capture the creator of Alphaville, Professor Von Braun and to destroy Alpha 60, the sentient computer that is the dictatorial ruler of the city. Can you dig it? Rather than going the same way Barbarella did by creating an alien planet on enormous sound stages in Chinachita Studios, Godard filmed the movie in Paris using modern locations in the city without special props or effects. The Paris Electricity Board building became the Alpha 60 computer center and the Hotel Scribe is most of the other locations on the planet. Godard takes the stainless steel and glass shininess of the architecture and combines it with the weird culture of Alphaville to give us a world that looks familiar but has a strangeness that really works. Alphaville for me is a weird gem of French New Wave cinema. Cinematographer Raoul Coutard makes the conceit of filming in Paris really work. There's a great four-minute single-take shot of Lemmy Caution checking into his hotel, taking a lift and moving through the corridors to his room, and that alone is worth the price of admission. Check it out.
My all-time favourite movie studio, Hammer, hit its peak with the third movie featuring their hero rocket scientist, Bernard Quatermass. The first two films were The Quatermass Experiment and Quatermass 2. Like the earlier films, this one is based on the BBC miniseries from the 1950s and was the work of one of the greatest scriptwriters Britain produced in the middle of the 20th century, Nigel Neal. Unlike the previous two movies, we don't get a shouty, toupee, drunk American playing Quatermass, also known as Brian Dunleavy. We get Scottish actor Andrew Keir, ably supported by Barbara Shelley and James Donald. Plot is really mind-blowing. While digging a new subway under Hobbs End Railway Station, workers find a large metallic object which drills and tools can't scratch, and around that object they find pre-human skeletons. Quatermass arrives and decides that it's an alien spaceship and not an unexploded World War II bomb that the military think it is. A compartment on the spaceship is breached and rotting insectile aliens are discovered. And as Quatermass and his team work on the ruins, the history and the nature of these Martians is revealed and the spaceship starts controlling humans who have psychic abilities. This is high concept stuff for the 60s. The acting effects and the progression of the revelations are all on point. Before 2001 A Space Odyssey gave us that giant DVD cover, Uplifting Human Intelligence, Quatermass and the Pit gave us an alternative speculation about human evolution that was darker and yet more comprehensible, and for me, much more entertaining. I've been a bad, bad boy. Peter Watkins' Privilege is a dark dystopian vision of 1960s music and youth culture being subverted to support and intensify a future fascist Britain. Like all of Watkins' work, Privilege is a docudrama. It tells us the story of Stephen Shorter, played by Paul Jones, who was part of Manfred Mann's band at the time. Stephen Shorter is a Birmingham-born British pop star whose stage act is based on the fact that he was once in prison. With mock police beatings and cruelty, his masochistic persona is a cathartic release for his audience of mostly teenage girls who empathise with the pain and injustice he portrays. Stephen Shorter is the biggest pop star in his world, but he's clearly suffering from a breakdown. He has no personal life and his management has turned him into a corporation over which he has no control. In his world, Stephen Shorter is as ubiquitous an intellectual property as Hello Kitty or Coca-Cola are in ours. He meets an artist called Vanessa, played by Gene Shrimpton, and they start a relationship. Vanessa encourages him to stand up for himself. Meanwhile, his minders are aligning their product with an increasingly fascist British government, which is weaponising the Church of England as a means of controlling the hearts and minds of the population. We will conform. Those are the words... Privilege is like a Black Mirror episode made four years before Black Mirror creator Charlie Brooker was even born. It's unashamedly didactic, and it uses that documentary format to chilling effect. Although Paul Jones and Gene Shrimpton aren't really good actors, their lack of skill actually works. The characters they play are also naive. They are innocents in a world where predatory men are turning the passions of young people into social cages in which to enslave them. There are parts of this movie that feel very, very contemporary. It's going to be a happy year in Britain, this year, in the near future. So there are my seven groovy science fiction movies from the 1960s. Let me know of any other movies you think should have been on the list. Uh, we can have a bit of a discussion about that. And thank you for watching, and please like and subscribe, and let me know anything else you'd like to see on the channel. I'll see you in a week with another video.